very good morning to you wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, online edition of SQL Bits 2020. And also welcome to the session called A Journey Through the Tidyverse. Briefly introducing myself, my name is Thomas Hütter. I'm from Germany, as you might uh, tell from the umlaut. I've been an application developer for most of my professional life and also did uh, some consulting stuff. The accidental debate task and a bit of authoring of small articles. I've worked at consultancies, ISVs, and at the moment I'm at the end user company. Mm, I've dealt with the uh, SQL Server since version 6.5. My daily job is uh, developing the software formerly called Navision, which is business central right now. And, and I've taken to R for version 3.1.2, that was about five years ago. Also, I'm a speaker at uh, SQL or data-related events around Europe. You see a couple of them there. And this is also you know, my third time talking at SQL Bits. Okay, so what are we going to do in this session? Um, for the people who don't know, I'll, I'll do a quick introduction and some prerequisites. If you want to play along with me uh, through the Tidyverse, we need the base system and IDE and the Tidyverse packages. Uh, I'll introduce you to the concepts of the Tidyverse, why is it in existence and then what does it contain. And then I'll introduce you to all the Tidyverse components. There are packages uh, that make up the Tidyverse uh, technically uh, and I also have demos for all of that stuff if you want to play along. At the end I'll do a quick recap, I'll, I'll share my resources with you uh, and probably we have time for some Q&A. Right. As the pre prerequisite for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the R language, what is it? Well, the R language is, a, let's say, a programming language is for statistical purposes and uh, visualization. It's widely used by statisticians, data miners, analysts, and the folks that call themselves data scientists. The sexiest job of this century, as you see. It was created by the two gentlemen named there, Ross and Roberts, uh, from New Zealand as a successor to the S language that had been there before, but that was proprietary, that was commercial, it was uh, uh, it was not free, it was expensive, it was not very good um, uh, in terms of extensions and so on. They wanted to do better, and so they invented R. They gave it uh, to the public domain by, um, or to the open source by making it a GNU project, which is now maintained by the R Foundation for Statistical Computing. Uh, they do compile builds for Mac OS, for Linux, for Windows. And also since, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, the, the R Consortium was uh, founded that um, supports uh, the, the ongoing development of R uh, in a bigger frame. There are companies like uh, Microsoft, Oracle, and Google uh, who are in this consortium. One of the main success factors for the R ecosystem is probably that it's extensible by so-called packages. There are over 16,000 packages available right now on the central CRAN mirror. And um, anyone who develops in R and, and maybe you thought there's a function missing and I have to develop it for myself, then I can uh, put that into a package load it up to the crown mirror and so that everybody else in the community can profit from it. So they don't have to, to invent the wheel all over again. Commercial support has been around at least since 2007 by a company that was called Revolution Analytics. They are now part of Microsoft uh, since uh, 2015 and provide us stuff like Microsoft are open and are so. Uh, there is uh, probably dozens of IDEs you can use for R from the basic naked R basic app uh, to R Studio, which is probably the de facto standard. Uh, also, that's the IDE I'm reusing. And there was something called the Microsoft R Tools for Visual Studio that had been around for a couple of years, but um, that has been deprecated from version 2019 on. Support for R is now in SQL Server. There are our services. There's the standalone R server. There's the Power BI. You can have the Azure Machine Learning uh, VMs and so on and so on. Okay. So if you want to play along, you get the, the demo scripts afterwards. You have to, to follow a few prerequisites. 
Uh, you should have an idea what I can use for. You probably have that, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Uh, you have to install the RPA system, which is available from the Grand Mirror. You get an IDE of your choice. As I said earlier, in my case, that's our studio. You can download it from the, the link stated there. And because we are dealing with the Tidyverse, you have to install the Tidyverse packages. So that's one call of install packages, Tidyverse, and from then on you can call it with library Tidyverse. So for those of you who are familiar with R, that's nothing new. And then, yeah, from the begin. So, the Tidyverse concept, why and what is it? If you look at this, um, Picture I took from a book uh, by Wickham and Caldwell. A typical data analysis, data science project may look like this. From left to right, you import some data from somewhere, which may be files or from the internet or from a database. Uh, it is rarely in a format that's already usable for your analysis, so you have to do some tidying or transforming. Um, those may be in that order, you can switch them, it sort of depends then uh, probably you want to, to visualize your data uh, in order to get some insights out of it. If you go in the direction of data science and then, um, artificial intelligence like that, that, you probably want to generate a model that may give you some predictions or so. So make your model um, and you take in understanding your data. You may have to transform it again to, to make it work better, visualize it again, redefine your model and so on. Once you're, you're okay with that, you probably want to communicate your results to internal or external customers, whatever. Uh, and the whole thing goes within the bracket of programming. So that is the, the uh, principle of, of how the Tidyverse works, uh, the Tidyverse tools work together. Uh, they cover all these tasks and um, they make it easy uh, to accomplish those in a very concise manner. Yeah, the goal is to provide a uniform interface so that the Tidyverse packages work together naturally. That is uh, uh, cited by Happy Wikim also, one of the brightest minds in the R ecosystem, by the way. Uh, and it means that the, the Tidy data should be stored in a consistent reusable structure. Rectangular data sets, which is uh, probably, it goes by, by uh, without speaking, if you use a, a data frame or so-called table, as we will see. But it also means that one row should have only one observation and one column should have one variable. We'll see later how that works out. And if you follow those, those rules and the principles, there'll be no need for conversion of your data in the middle of your analysis. You just pass it on between the packages of the tidyverse and you can concentrate on your data and not on the on the conversion of the stuff in the middle. Okay, so much for the principles. The tidyverse components. Here we find, uh, as we had all, all those uh, on all those tasks in this uh, figure, you find them here from from top to bottom, from import to to program, uh, and I listed all the tidyverse packages that go under those uh, under those tops. The core packages are those that are underlined. They are um, the packages that get installed or that get um, that get applied when you call the library tidyverse all at once. If you need additional packages, those that are not underlined, you have to call them one by one where you need them. And then there's some even non-tidyverse packages. That's mainly the yeah, markdown and the shiny package. For each of the core packages, I've got the demo uh, to show in my scripts, uh, and we break it down side by side. So for the import task, those are the packages that are related to the import task, and I state briefly in one sentence what the package does. So for example, the reader, which is part of the core, mainly imports flat files like CSV and others, but also um, uh, tab, tab separated and so on. You can uh, import Excel files, uh, all in new format. There's the DBI package for, uh, for attaching to databases. There are HTTR, XML, RVIS packages that uh, relate to scraping data from the web. And there's even JSON Lite, yeah. JSON, the, the XML of the hipster, uh, has its place here also. So now what I'm gonna do, 
I'm not going to only read those to you. I have, as I said, some demos prepared. And let me just switch over to my uh, studio environment here. So this is the uh, studio IDE that I have uh, uh, recommended before. Just a quick run through what you see here. On the top left, you've got the, the source code window. Of course, you can have several source files open. On the bottom left, it's the console, which gives the output, and it's also for, for interactive calling of functions. You have a, a terminal window if you need to decompile some tasks on the, on the OS level. Relatively new is the jobs window. If you have a long-running script, you can start it as a job in the background, leave it running, and turn to some foreground task again. On the top right, the environment, which is empty now, but you'll see all the variables that we are going to create will be listed up here. There's the history. I should have cleaned that. Uh, command history, uh, if you want to, to, to repeat your commands, you can manage database connections up here. And the newest addition is the tutorial tab. So you can even start tutorials on the R language from within the R Studio IDE. On the bottom right, we've got a small file explorer. We've got a window for the plot outputs. There goes the list of the packages. Those are the packages that are installed on my machine. That's the help window here because um, yeah, it has help on the R language, it has help on R Studio, and it also has help on every package that you install. Because um, one prerequisite for, for uploading a package to the Grand Mirror is it should have a help site. Okay? And then there's a viewer tab for stuff that doesn't go in the plot window. All right, so um, what we're going to do is uh, invoke that script, and you can do that line by line by command and enter. Or on Windows that we control enter, we just clean up the bottom here. And I'll start with uh, attaching some libraries that we need. And then we can already start by importing some data. So if you see here, we got the, the read CSV with a dot in the middle. That's the base R uh, way to call that. And then you've got the tidyverse one, which is which has an underscore here. Um, the result is the same. I, I, Loaded a Titanic data set, the result is the same. It gives me 891 observations of 12 variables. So that is 891 rows of, of columns of data. Um, the difference you see here on the bottom, the Tidyverse version already gives you an idea what the data types are that you just loaded here. Okay? So if I show you the, the structure, uh, that those imports result in the standard is a data frame, and the tidyverse version is a so-called tibble uh, dago. That has some properties uh, which we'll discuss later. Also, if you just simply print it out, the base version will totally run off your screen and, and clutter everything up. If you just print the tidyverse version, it stops usually after 10 lines, it gives you the, um, the data types in your columns, and also it has some special marks like here with the red color for, for unusual values like NA, which is comparable to a null value in the SQL code. And you can use that not only to load local files, you can also, with the same call to CSV, pull it over the internet. And yeah, the result here is the same. In the beginning, um, the tidy was stated that, that some of their commands were by the factor of 10 faster than the, the standard ones. So I created a CSV file with um, some, I think it's 4 million lines in it. And you see here the, the standard version of a needs about 4.7 seconds. And if you call the tidy was version, it runs in 1 point something seconds. So, Usually, realistically, you can gain a, a, a speed advantage of a factor of four to five by using the, the input routines of the tidyverse package. Your mileage may vary. Okay, um, I'm going to load some data. 
which we'll need later on. The first and one of my favorite data sets is this one. It's the Formula One uh, racing series result of the 2016 season. Um, yeah, <laughs> why is it the 2016? I stick to that because that was the last time the German guy won. Oh, good reason in that. So we were interested in, in the data that's here right in the middle, all the points of all the races, 2016. And you see that there's lots of distorting things around, like advertising and buttons and menus and so on. But very simple, we can extract that from this side by a couple of uh, simple R commands. Like this, we read the HTML, we extract the, the table node and, and put it uh, into a variable. And you see down here, we got all the data we just saw there, right? The drivers, the positions, and all the racing points. We'll get back to that later. And for an alternative, I got some data from the um, International Monetary Fund. I'll just read that also. That is statistical data like gross domestic products and, and investment rate and, and unemployment for all the countries in the world divided up into different um, country groups. So we read that also from the internet. Leave it just there, we'll see that in a moment, what to do with it. Okay. Next up. Yeah, I start with transform. I think in the graph it said tidy first, but uh, transform comes in handy here. So the transform part of the tidyverse consists of uh, several packages also, which are mainly the deployer package, which uh, does data manipulation, uh, like arranging and filtering and selecting and so on. There's um, a package for string operations, there's tool for factors and so on. There's also uh, specialized tools for, for data, time, classes, and for uh, binary block data. So, a transform script looks like this. Clean this up. I have to, again, attach the libraries we want to use, like deployer and tibble. And then we'll add on to the Formula One data uh, we just imported in the in the step before. And you see, it, it's not very complete, like it has no column names here, where there's uh, zero points, there are some dashes here, and, and it's not very useful in that format. So we'll have to do something about that, like um, adding column names. Then I can transform it into a table. Um, I filled it down to the nine best drivers because otherwise it will be too much for the, for the visualization later. And then I'll do some, some wrangling and yeah, finally it looks like this. We have a table, which is the, the proper sidiverse format of things, um, containing the nine best drivers. We've got race one to race um, 22 if it's complete, all the points here. And where there is zero points, uh, um, we're getting there's a zero in this table also. Okay, equally for our, our economic data, that has column names already. You see there's data from 1980 to 2024. Um, there are country groups and so on. Those are the country groups that all the countries in the world. There's the Euro area, there's the European Union, there's Asian and, and Latin America and stuff like that. And those are all the measures that are contained in this in this big formula, uh, in this big um, table. It's cross to metric project, a product, it's uh, national savings, it's inflation rates and so on. So we cut that down to some, I think it's like six of them in the end. So we'll have these six measures uh, measured for all those, those uh, country groups. And already here you see we got some missing values and minus values. But that's uh, one step to clean the data and we'll continue with that. Okay, in the tidy step. Um, yeah, that contains mainly those two packages, Tibble and Tidier, both are core packages. Um, there, the Tibble, or let's say, uh, um, data collection type is uh, is defined, which is a modern take on data frames. What does it mean? 
it never changes your input styles, uh, input types. When you have a data frame, it tends to, to um, convert strings to factors, although that's not always wanted. Civil doesn't do that. It doesn't adjust variable names, which allows for crazy names like starting with an apostrophe or something like that. It has no role names, which may or may not be uh, good. And it does a prettier print output, which we already saw. It gives you the, the data times in the, in the column header and so on. And then next, and a very important part of the tidy was the tidy package, which contains functions um, uh, to generate the proper format of your data. So those functions used to be mainly were the, the gather and the spread function. They have been, uh, well, sort of deprecated. They still work, but they will be, they go out of order. So they are um, replaced by the pivot longer and pivot wider functions. Let's see how that works within the tidy package. So we we'll love the library tidier. I think we had the table earlier, so that's not a problem. And we continue on our formula one data. This is in the so-called white format. You see all the races are spread around there, but the races really are the, the observations. So they should go into the rows, not the columns. And that can be accomplished by simply calling the gather function. And that turns our data into a long form. You've got one column for the race, and all the races will be, uh, will be listed down here. And we got one column for the points, where all the values are done here. It has the same content of information, just a different form. Also, you can accomplish that with the new function, the pivot longer. Doesn't make a difference. Uh, it does make a difference. It, it does order it uh, in another manner. It orders it on, on the first um, column uh, and then on the races. But uh, from the content of information, it's strictly the same. So that's something we have to do also with our economical data because there you got all the years uh, spread up into the columns, which is not what we want. So I'll turn that into a long format again. So we have one column for the year and all the years are, are listed below that. But in this case, we have to be, do the opposite thing because the, the subject descriptors does contain actually the variables and they should go into the columns. So we have to apply not only gather, but all the, the spread function here. And after that, we have the observations, like how did the advanced economies do in the year 2000, and all our variables are here in the columns. All right? And while we are here, I'll just quickly demonstrate the two other functions that do similar things on, on, the, on the smaller level, like if you've got a column that has two values in it, like here, first name and family name, separated by a, a non-alphanumeric character, and you want to split that up into two separate um, columns, that's one call to the separate functions, and you see here we got two different, uh, two different columns made out of that. Or the opposite, if you want to combine two two columns into one, there's the unite function. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense in this case. I combine the position and the driver name um, to be in, in one column down here. Okay, so that, those were the main functions in the, in the tidy department of things. Let's just move on. What comes next? Visualize. Yes, very important. There's one central package in, in the visitor section, that's ggplot2, uh, where gg stands for grammar of graphics. And um, so my brief explanation how that works is, yeah, you, you call a plot function and you have to give it some parameters, of course. So first you, you initialize the plot by stating the data frame of the table to be used. Next you define the so-called aesthetic mappings per plot or even per layer. Uh, that basically means you, you tell the function what goes on the x-axis, what goes on the y-axis. Then you can add layers of geometry, geometry representation of the data. So there you can say, do you want a bar graph, do you want a scatter plot, or how do you want 
the, the data representation to look. And optionally, you can add many other many other things like scales, like facets. You can add themes on top of your plot. You can play around with colors and um, labels and, and legends and all that stuff. Okay, let's visualize some data. Yep. We'll attach the ggplot package and we call the ggplot function. Yeah, we start again with our Formula 1 data. I can do this. And you see down here, there's a, there's a gray area that appeared here. This is a valid graph already, although it doesn't contain much data, of course. That's only the, the data frame of the table uh, you want the data to come from. Next up, the aesthetics. OK, so here we already got the, the, um, the ticks on, on the axis for race down here and for the points here. So the plot function of a real life, there's from 0 to 25 points uh, in this data, and we have to visualize that. Next up, I'll do the geometry. Yeah, you can do point geometry or line geometry, and probably those are not what you expected. So let's just move on to the next one like this. And there you see, even though I, I cut it down here to nine drivers, that's a simple mess. Yeah. So if you want to, to get any information out of it down here, it'll be difficult. Up there you can see some single lines going to the top and down, but overall it's cluttered. So um, what can we do about this? Well, we'll apply some facility. Okay. Like this. With faceting, um, every group, and in this case, that's every child, that gets uh, their own small soft graphic with the data and then applies to them. So the data in here, again, it's absolutely the same content as it was in the, in the graph before, only the representation is different and it makes it easier easier to, to follow up on the points for a single driver and also, I guess, easier to compare because we have these auxiliary lines. Um, and you can see, for instance, for instance, um, here, fifth race, both of the Mercedes zero points because they crashed into each other. Yeah, the team boss biting into the table. And uh, usually at that point, if I have um, Dutch folks in the audience, they raise their hands and, yeah, Max Verstappen won. And, right. You see up here, Max Verstappen really won the race in that season. So, and then I usually say, yes, he won, but that was an outlier. Okay, so if you want to make it look a little bit more like statistics or data science, you can do some other graphs like this one. The so-called um, box plots. If you have never dealt with box plots before, what do they represent? They represent the distribution of the data. So not the, the, um, the addition of the points, but the distribution. Because again, it goes from 0 to 25. And then we got, let's uh, start with Mr. Ricardo. The, the line in the middle of the box is the so-called median or, or the 50% line. That simply means uh, it is at like 12 points. So that means in 50% of the cases, uh, the driver gained less than 12 points in this case, and in 50%, he gained more than uh, 12 points. The top and the bottom of the box are the 25% and 75%. So uh, in 25% of the, of the races, Mr. Ricardo would have gained less than 10 points. And in 75%, you would have gained less than 50 points. Then there are some lines. I don't care about their definition right now. Um, but any points that lie outside the length of this line will be plotted separately. And, and those are called real outlines, like this and like this. And if we compare the two, Rosberg and Hamilton, the two graphs here look totally the same, and they are actually, they are identical. And even though uh, one of them won, Mr. Rosberg, so he, he must have done something different. So how come that this is not uh, visible in this graph? Well, simply because uh, it shows statistical measures. 
And those statistical measures are these here, minimum zero points. The same for both, maximum 25 points, also the same. The median is at 18 points for both drivers. So the only difference in, the, in these statistical measures is the, the mean value, which is a bit higher for Mr. Rosberg, but that's not shown in this graph. So that's why it looks totally um, the same. Okay, one last graph representation. Uh, just to have something funny here. Those are called, yeah, if you look at the last one here, you know, they're called violin plots. Uh, you know why if you look at Gutenberg. And also those represent the, the distribution of your data. If you look very carefully, maybe down here that uh, the Hammond graph is a bit wider down here at the bottom. Which means that he has got more of the of the low point um, results wider, and if you look maybe around here, then you see that the the Rosberg graph is wider than the other one, which means that he scored more of the high point results, and because he got more high points in the end, he won the season. As simple as that, right? And you see, yeah, Mr. Ricardi was a bit. Uh, a bit of everything. <laughs> right. Wiley plots. Okay, um, let me just clean that up. Then for some of the economical data, uh, let me see. Yeah, you can, for instance, uh, compare the investment of other country groups like this, uh, or if you go. Yeah, even to lose some points, but yeah, that's also difficult down here to, to, to get the uh, the distinction between all those. So again, what comes in place handy here is the so-called facet wrap, which uh, by the tip of the finger, it, it cuts down the graph into, into uh, smaller subgraphs per country group. And if you if you look at the at the code that's um, that's necessary actually to produce this graph. Once your data is in shape, it, it doesn't take much more than two lines. Because those two lines already produce a graph like that, and the rest is like doing a bit of scaling, uh, doing a bit of coloring, and, and making it look a bit prettier. So with very little effort of, of coding, um, you can achieve great results here. Okay, so much for no visual arts. Okay, next up, uh, the modeling part of things. As I said, you can you can um, set up models that um, turn into predictions and so on. I'm, I'm not a specialist of this. Uh, so formally, we have the mainly the model R package here. Uh, and uh, it's a quite new development that is uh, the collection of packages called the tidy models. And it has um, packages for, for sampling, for um, modeling functions, for pre-processing, for optimizing, and so on. You name it, they got it. And let's see what the demo about that brings us. Yeah. If you paid attention, there's no demo for this. Why is that? Because none of those packages are core tiny those packages. They're all additional ones. So let's just move on. Um, the communicate, okay, a central part here, definitely, again, the ggplot package, but then you've got the R markdown for, for rendering files to uh, PDF, HTML, other performance, and there's the Shiny framework. Shiny framework is a framework to build interactive applications in R, again, with very little effort of, of coding. So I just switch over, because I have one right here. If you look at this, that's the source file of a mere 60 lines. And, and there's already some, some comment lines. And that's the whole Shiny app. And um, the RStudio environment notices it's an app. So it uh, adds the, the run app button up here. If you press that, it's yeah, surprise, it runs the app. And now, this is interactive. I can click here on these radio buttons and influence which data is displayed on the right hand part. You see, like this. And that runs on my machine. I can open it in a browser like this. It has the same uh, responsiveness. 
and already that could be um, that could be called by anyone in my local network, right? So if I want to share that with my colleagues, uh, that would be quite easy. And if um, you want to go one step further, you see here the publish or republish button. I already published it before. You can publish it to a distance server, which I did here. And again, it calls the, the internet browser. That takes some seconds because the server sends application to sleep once they're idle for a couple of minutes. Um, and yeah, look at the, at the address of that one. That's a shinyapps.io server. I have no clue where now it stands, and uh, I don't have to know. Um, that is a service offered also by our studio, where you can um, you, you can host your, your Shiny applications on their server. So that practically makes it usable or, or callable by anyone with internet connection. Right, so. This now runs on the Shiny App Server, and it's almost as responsive as it was in, in the local uh, in the local version. So I've got a free plan. It gives me a couple of, uh, of apps that I can publish. Um, if you want a professional version, paid you pay money for that, of course. But then you get all the user credential management and so on, so you can. Uh, you can really control who gets access to your to your visualizations and who doesn't. Okay, as simple as that. Yeah. Okay. I've got some that. Come on here. Just play with me. Okay. Stop. Right, that was the part communicates. So back to our back to our slides, and then we are in the yeah programming uh, task, which has a couple of components. Um, one of them is the so-called Magrita, which uh, mainly introduces the forward pipe operator. I'll show you what that does in a minute. It's for chaining commands and um, uh, very elegantly. Pass on parameters. Then there's the per package that has tools for functional programming, um, like the map functions, where you can use those instead of looping through through functions and, and through data sets or, or using apply function and so on. Uh, and then there's the glue package, uh, yeah, an alternative to paste. I think I've never used that one actually. So just for a quick overview. Of uh, this one, there you go. We have the Magruder package. I call the other ones as well. So if you if you think back to the very beginning, uh, I pulled the data from the Formula One website like this. I did it in, in three consecutive steps. One is um, pulling the HTML construct, then getting the node out of it, and in the third step. Uh, I would pull the table data, and and then you need three variables to accomplish that. And at the end, I can trash two of them, right? So there's a more compact way, or there are different ways of, of uh, accomplishing this uh, in a more compact way. One would be the the C plus plus or C programmers way of doing it, like nesting a function around the function within the function. And then somewhere in the back, there's a parameter. And once you're back here, you've already forgotten where does it belong to, to which function. So it accomplishes the task of, yeah, in, in one step, um, pulling data from the internet and putting it into the variable. Uh, but that's not very maintainable, not, not very good, um, very good practice of, of source coding. And then on the other side, we got the, the so called pipe. Which is uh, introduced by the Magruder package. So we have the, the read HTML, and the result of that is piped into the next function call. Then you got the HTML node, and the result of that again is piped into the HTML table, and then at the end it gets assigned to the variable. So you see that the, let me see, 
the HTML node. Here it had two parameters, and here we've got only one. That is because the first parameter comes through the pipe, and so on and so on, from one function call to the other. So we can also accomplish this without needing any uh, any intermediary variables, uh, but it is very much better readable in my mind than this construct up here. So that's the, the recommended way of doing it, the tiny was way. Okay? Right, then we got some functional programming. Let me just check. Uh, I'll, step that. I'll step over that very quickly. Uh, if you want to, let me see. If you want to calculate, let's say, the median over, over the um, over the columns of, of a data frame, like I have a data frame here that has four columns, and, and you want to calculate the median value of all four of those columns, you can just call it one by one like this. Uh, the next simple way would be to to call it in a loop, so you have to go along the segments um, of the columns uh, and call the median and put it out. I don't even remember what that one is for. And you can um, you can even make the, the function into a parameter. So uh, a function, that one here, a function that takes a function as a set of parameters like this, which makes it a bit versatile. So you can uh, say, I want the summary over my over my data frame. Once I want the median, in the next moment I want the mean value, and in there I have the standard deviation. Uh, and to make all that more compact, and it comes out of the box, uh, so to speak, with the with the um, with the Perl library, there are the map functions. So you can just um, give those two parameters to, to prefab uh, functions called map, like map double if you expect a double value as a result, and um, it gives you the result. So I hope for those who are familiar with function programming that that was enough of an overview. Yeah, otherwise, it would be uh, it would be stuff enough for for another session of maybe one hour. Okay, right. So there we go. Already at the wrap up. What did we see? Well, messy data sets are messy. Uh, Every one in its own way. Tiny sets are all alike. That's what Hadley Wiggum said. So to avoid this messiness of, of data you get from here or there or everywhere, you engage the tiny data, the tidyverse philosophy, and the tidyverse tools that I introduced to you. So you convert the messy to tiny data in the first place, which means one variable per column, one observation per row, we saw that. Um, each type of unit is a tibble, which is better in most places than a data frame. And that, uh, that covers for easier passing of the data between the tools and the packages of the tidyverse and makes them work together in a yeah, natural way, let us call it that. Okay? Right. So, my resources. Um, yeah, there's the tidyverse website, of course. There's a book by, by Wickham and Gurumon, which is also available online. Um, the Tidy Manifesto. The R Studio folks don't only produce the, the R Studio IDE, they do uh, the Shiny framework, and you can use that for free. You can get the, the free plan on their Shiny app server and so on. So take a look there. Yeah, my data came from the IMF and from Formula One. And I am at this place. So it's time to say thank you for your time and interest. If you want to keep in touch, just ping me at one of those social media channels. And there's a link. You will get the, the slides and the scripts uh, for this session uh, to download from there. So thank you very much. And by that, do we have time for Q&A? Question mark.